My name is Robert Grant. I'm a father of three beautiful children and a beautiful wife, Danielle Grant. I've been coming to New Song for about a year and a half now. I've been looking online for churches. Uh, my wife and I visited numerous churches here in Oceanside area and just didn't really find the right fit. Um, and so we were looking something for not just both her and I, but also for our children. And so when we discovered New Song online, we were hooked when we had our first attendance. Uh, back in 2013, uh, when I was struggling in my addiction and almost had to serve a five-year prison sentence, um, I discovered a program called Teen Challenge. And so my stepfather is the one that introduced me to Teen Challenge. And I was reluctant to submit and surrender my life uh, entering into the program, but after four months, I had this amazing encounter and experience with God uh, that I can't actually put into words. And from that moment, I was forever changed. It was really cool to see how God really met me with where I was at. Um, coming from a troubled upbringing, bad past, in and out of uh, jail, things that many kids shouldn't do at my age or at that age at that time, um, I was able to know what love was. And so love um, really met me and allowed me to realize that my life had more meaning and value than the things that I was doing before prior. Uh, since being here at New Song, I've been able to spearhead a life group with both Danielle and myself. Um, we really want to connect with um, other married couples and just pour into them because we know the value of marriage and what it really means. Uh, we also, um, myself, uh, is involved with the youth here at New Song, and so I just love pouring into youth because that's where I was troubled. That's where I didn't have identity. That's where I didn't have purpose and meaning in life. And so everything that I can give back to them um, and allow them to have um, purpose and value and significance through the, the gospel um, and the good news, um, I'm, I'm there to do it. My life is the power of prayer. My mom prayed um, on numerous occasions for me to come to the revelational knowledge of who Christ was. And through my troubled walk and through my rebellious actions, her prayers uh, came to fruition. And so now, even in my own life, with the troubles that I encounter on a daily basis and the things that I often am reluctant to surrender to the Lord, God has taught me through prayer that when I surrender these things, that things come about in a supernatural way. So I'm extremely grateful that um, we can come to God boldly before his throne and give him all of our troubles and worries. When it comes to a new Christian, I think one of the biggest things that I would you know, recommend to them is learning to not come into a situation or to the church with a preconceived notion. Let God be the one that guides them, that teaches them, and that instructs them. So have an open heart to receive and don't look at people to be the determining factor as to whether or not God is real or evident or what have you, but allow God to reveal himself to you personally and realize that God brings people into the church because they're broken and they need to be made whole. And so you do need that same um, uh, 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 wholeness uh, to come about within your life. And so don't, um, don't be hesitant to allow God to do that in you and don't look at others in this manner that you might have um, coming into the churches for your first time. One thing I love about New Song is the community that is here. One thing my wife and I didn't really have or don't necessarily have around here is family and we found family here and something I learned from a gentleman the other day is that community is common unity and there's a common unity here though what what brings different cultures together and it feels like family so when you walk into the, the doors of new song there's something that's special about it it's a different place it's not just a church it's a community of other fellow believers that come together with the same mission, the same mindset, that love one another as Christ has loved the church. And so I truly love being here. Yeah. My name is Robert, um, and that's my story. Thank you.
and welcome to New Song. If you ask me, this is a perfect day for church. We gather to worship on Sunday morning because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday morning. Everything we are going to do here today is because he is alive. Jesus is at work in this world and in your life. Do you believe that? Would you please find the connection card in your program and fill it out right now? This is one great way that our church connects with each other. It helps us know what you need prayer for, maintain your current contact information, and let us know if you have had a spiritual conversation this past week. If this is your first time you've been to New Song, you are a VIP, and we have a gift for you today, just to say thanks for being here. It's a New Song Tumblr and a book our pastor wrote that answers the five most common questions people have about God. If you are a VIP, you can take that connection card with you to the VIP desk in the lobby after service to pick up your gift. Everyone else, you can put them in the offering bags after the message. Welcome to all those joining us online this morning. I hope you have felt God's presence during this time wherever you are. Would you please join our live congregations in filling out that connection card as well? There's information in the chat about how to find it. New Song exists to help you know Jesus better and live for him more passionately. We love that God has enabled us to do this in the community. Look in your program for a minute to see the incredible things we have going on that will help you and your family grow in Christ. I'd like to tell you about an awesome opportunity to learn to share your faith. The Billy Graham Evangelism Association chose New Song Church as a site to teach their famous Christian Life and Witness course. What this means is that you'll have an expert instructor on evangelism teach you how to share your faith and help someone take their next steps as a Christ follower. This training is also part of the process to become a prayer partner when Franklin Graham, Billy's son, comes to Chula Vista in March to lead hopefully a thousands to Christ. I hope you take advantage of this unique opportunity to join Christ followers from all over Northern County and to learn how to share your faith from the Billy Graham team. Oh, and if you don't know who Billy Graham is, Google him. He was an amazing man of God. I'll see you at the Christian Life and Witness course. On January 16th, we'll be starting a five-week reading group on one of Pastor Hell's top 10 all-time best reads, The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. This powerful, life-changing book is a must-read. It has forever changed my thoughts and ideas on giving, generosity, and faith. In this book, the author shares with us his real-life experiences with trusting and testing God. He expands on how God blesses us in our efforts to be used as a blessing to others. Be ready to read three chapters a week. Each meeting will share thoughts, contemplate questions, and see how God is working in us through each principle. So get ready to start the year with one of Pastor Hal's suggested reads, The Blessed Life. Pick up your copy and join us Tuesday, January 16th at 6.30. If you are interested but can't afford a copy, just let us know. We, we look, look forward, forward to seeing, seeing you there. Life on earth is hard, but having friends around you makes it so much better especially friends who can encourage you with godly truths. Having Christian friends in your life can be the difference between a hard life and a great life. So this is your chance to go make some new friends. Please stand up and see if you can make one new friend in the next minute. Well, hey, good morning, New Song. I want to invite you all to stand with us this morning as we get ready for a time of worship. We're going to have a great morning and a great service, but we're just so excited to enter into the new year together. Amen. Thank you. 
He has been so good to us throughout this year, and he will continue to be good to us throughout this next coming year, throughout all of the trials and tribulations and everything that we face. We can count on God to be faithful through it all. Let's sing this out together. Remember those walls. Remember those walls that we caught sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. His walls are up and down. Remember those giants. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that we couldn't Giants are dead now. Sing this out. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let every man proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your glories, your majesties, every way that you have worked in our lives, Father. We're so grateful not only to know you, but to serve your name, to build your kingdom here. Lord, I pray that right now you can descend into our hearts and minds and that you can just open us up to what you want us to hear this morning. Open us to receive what you want us to receive this morning. As, uh, as we prepare to just take on the next year. Father, I pray that you walk beside every single one of us in this room. Lord, we lift all of these things up to you faithfully. We are so grateful for everything that you've done in our lives. And in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This year, I mean it. I mean it, mean it. I could not possibly mean it anymore. I got this. Candy bars, gone. Funyuns, gone. Ice cream, candy bars and Funyuns are gone. This year, I'm gonna connect with people, IRL. In real life. I made a list. That means I mean it. I'm gonna take care of myself. Right after I figure out who that is, other than a mom which I love. I beat myself up. I'm never good enough. That has to change. Why do I do that? I'm such an idiot. See? This year I'm gonna work on being the cool dad, you know? Maybe go to the skate park, hang out with my kids. No biggie. <laughs> this works, right? I gotta learn to forgive myself. You know, give myself a break. Not be perfect. I've got it. I'm gonna step outside of my comfort zone by volunteering at the hospital. Maybe the pet shelter. Cause cats, they're so much easier. This year, I'm gonna forgive my mom. Now that I am a mom, I, I totally get it. This year I'm gonna start reading literature. You know, books and such. Cause I hear it's good for me. This year, I'm shaving my back hair. I am tired of those kids at the neighborhood pool calling me Sasquatch. It's just that I am comfortable staying in my comfort zone. Who am I kidding? God, I wear myself out. 
trying to outdo everyone. I, I can one up everything and it's exhausting. I have a lot of baggage and it is not all from the mall. Well, some of it is. I'm trying, God, I am. But there's a reason why I'd rather stay at home. I'm weak, God. I know it, you know it. And you know what, God? This year, I'm giving you all the places that hurt. I'm gonna give you all of my failed attempts that I think are gonna make me a better man. You are a strong fortress, God, you. And I'm gonna let you be strong in my weakness. All right, God, I'm gonna start with the best relationship, you and me. And then we'll move outward from there. Hmm? Because this year, I mean it. I mean it. I mean it. I mean it. Hey, good morning, everybody, and happy almost New Year, huh? We've had, oh, this is Fred. Everybody say hi, Fred. Hi. I'm going to tell you about hi. Fred in just a second here. Uh, I, I was thinking as that went on, you know, we, this is day 365, right? It's the easy day to count here. Uh, and isn't God good? He's been merciful to us, and for many of us, great and abundant and all that sort of stuff for 365 days. And he could have set up the world. I think he could have set the whole universe to go in a straight line, but instead he, he made us spin in circles so that tomorrow we're going to be back to where we were January 1st last year, which gives us a chance to start over. So if it was a great year, it's a launching pad for even greater. And if it was a terrible year, all starts over tomorrow, right? His mercies are new every morning, every week, every month, and every year. And so we're getting ready for the new year, and that's what this service is all about. And I invited Fred to join me. This is the first time we've done dual stools. Uh, if you stool, I call it stool time. It doesn't count against the sermon time. This is dual stools this morning. Uh, so Fred's here because he leads pretty much most of the chaplains on base and, uh, and is encouraging a lot of our Marines and sailors to do something that I think a lot of us ought to do too. So what is that? So two years ago, just about same date, you challenged all of us to read through Proverbs and find somebody to pair with. And we did that for two years. And as the year progressed, I was like, there's got to be more. And in the Navy, we have a program that's called Get Real, Get Better. So in other words, be honest with yourself, look at what your failures are, and then get better with it. Well, what better way to get to know God than to read through his word in a year? So there are a lot of different ways that we can do that. There are the one-year Bible. There are plans that you can get to out online. There are different things. But what I put out a challenge to my Marines and sailors and their families is we're going to work through uh, Tara Lee Cobble's uh, podcast called The Bible Recap. And we start tomorrow, and 365 days later, we'll finish up. And it also has a podcast that goes with it. So you read the daily reading, then you sit down and listen to it. So how many people have ever sat down and read the Bible, and then what did I read? And especially like Leviticus, you know. So <laughs> she tells us a little bit more about what those themes are. So that's what the challenge is. And if you're willing to join with us on doing that, see me or see somebody after the, uh, the service here, or go to the website, thebiblerecap.com, and uh, you can join us with that. It would be kind of cool. It is kind of cool. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, which works out to just a little less than four chapters a day. So if you'll follow this, uh, she's got a pattern. There's a lot of those out there, and, you, uh, and you'll, you'll, you're doing with a lot of America's finest if you do this. So talk to Fred afterwards, or just go to thebiblerecap.com. Is that what it is? I think so. Fair enough, huh? Ready yep. to do that? Be a good way to start the year, wouldn't it? Hey, another good way to prepare to start the year is uh, I brought my friend Dennis Keating to come speak to us today. Dennis pastored for three decades at uh, Emmanuel Faith, which was the largest Protestant church in North County in, over in Escondido. And uh, when I moved here, he was kind to me. And uh, many times throughout my ministry so far, he's been kind and a mentor and a lover and an encourager. And uh, so I asked him if he'd close out the year for us so that I could do my year-end review and you could have richness from God's word. So would you all say welcome to Dennis as he comes on up? And I'll bring that for you if you want. Normally we have a colonel who brings it up for us. G God bless you. Good morning, New Song Church. 
Uh, I'm a Bible guy, and so uh, let's open our Bibles together to Mark chapter 6. If you brought a phone with you or a tablet or underneath every third chair, there's a Bible here in the uh, worship center, the auditorium. You'll be able to follow along Mark chapter 6. I'm really honored to be with you today. Uh, it's my privilege to have been connected to a new song and how for a long time. And whenever he calls, I'm more than happy to come out and join you and uh, worship with you. So I want to begin our time together uh, this morning. Ask him uh, for your input. Uh, do you think that if you experience a miracle, it will automatically increase your faith? What do you think? If God does something really spectacular in your life, do you think it will cause you to grow? Well, it's an interesting question because according to our text of Scripture this morning, the answer is uh, sometimes. Not automatic, just sometimes. And before I share with you why that is, I want to just set a quick context for you in the Gospel of Mark. I'm a big believer that context is really, really important to understand the meaning of words. And the Gospel of Mark sets the whole context for the, the message that he focused on in chapter 1 and verse 1. And it simply says this, that Mark is writing the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There it is. The, the, the whole book is about Jesus. Jesus was his human name. That's what his uh, mom and dad would have called him. He had brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters. They would have called him Jesus. What his buddies would have called him. Christ is the messianic title. It identifies him as the promised king of Israel. Uh, Son of God is a clear reference to his divine nature. And so right at the very beginning, uh, Mark sets up now what he's going to write about. Chapter 1, verse 1. And then for 16 chapters, he gives proofs as to why that is true. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is very action-oriented. If you ever want to know about the things Jesus did, go to the Gospel of Mark, because that was his focus. Uh, one of the key words in the Gospel of Mark is the word immediately. And immediately he went, and immediately he went, and immediately he went. It focuses on all the things that Jesus did. Well, in chapter 6, we're going to see two of the stupendous miracles that Jesus performed and they're going to communicate one key idea that becomes our New Year's challenge. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Yeah. Here's the message from the Lord. Here's our New Year's challenge. Simply this. Be open to Jesus doing the impossible in your life. Open up your heart to it. Because God has awesome power that he demonstrates through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Two miracles that we're going to look at are the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking upon the water. And both of them are going to bear witness to us this morning that Jesus has the power to do whatever it takes to bring about God's will in my life, in your life, and in our lives together at New Song Church, okay? And it's all summed up because God is powerful. Mark chapter 10 and verse 27. This is what uh, the scriptures say. See this verse up on the screen? For some things are possible with God. What's it say? For how many things? All things are possible with God. So, beloved, what situation are you facing? Did you face it in 2023 and you look forward to 24? What situation is so hard and so difficult that you think, no way that's going to change? 
Uh, what person in your life is so upside down that she or he seems like will never be right side up ever again? What's got you stuck? What's got you paralyzed? What's kind of making you afraid to even hope that life could be different in 2024 than it was in 2023? And then maybe for a lot of us, we just need a fresh touch from the Lord this next year. It's not that things are bad, but it just kind of ho-hum. Anybody need a fresh touch from the Lord? Come on, this is all of us, isn't it? We, we, we all need it here. And the message from the Lord uh, today is open up your heart to it. Because our Lord can do the impossible. All right? That's the, the big message. Because we can go home now. So if somebody asks you, what did the Lord uh, talk about uh, to you uh, this morning? Let your heart be open to God doing the impossible. That's the message from the Lord, okay, for this next year. Now, in the few minutes that we have left, I, I want to take you through Mark chapter 6 and tell you why you should do it. Five reasons why our heart should be open to the Lord doing the impossible uh, this next year. First, uh, because Jesus knows what's going on in your life. Let's pick up our text, Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. We'll dig in. Uh, the apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. So in the historic context, this point in time in his ministry, Jesus had trained the twelve. He had empowered them and he sent them out to preach all over the northern area of Israel called Galilee. And they were to go out and preach the word. They were going to go out and heal the sick. They were to go out and cast out demons. And they did that for weeks. And they came back and reported to Jesus all the things that God had done. It was magnificent things that the Lord did. The point being, though, it had left them completely exhausted. And the Lord knew it. Verse 31. Here's his plan. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Now, uh, friends, that's too busy. But these guys are going like crazy. And so the Lord knew it. The Lord was aware of what they needed here. He could feel and understand their exhaustion. So they make plans to go on a retreat. But the plans don't work out as they had hoped. Verse 32. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. So they're getting away from people. They need some rest. Verse 33. The people saw them going and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. Now, when you hear the word large, how many people do you think of? Uh, probably in the context, think fifteen to 20,000. So they're trying to get away from people. They're exhausted. They're so busy, they don't even have time to grab some food. And so Jesus says, let's go on a retreat. They get in a boat and they go across the lake and they look up ahead and there's 20,000 people waiting for them. Some retreat, huh? That's the context here. I, I don't know about you. If I'm one of the local ministers in that boat, if I'm one of the apostles, I'm a little ticked off. And I'm trying to get away. All I see now are more demands. That's not the way Jesus saw it, though. Verse 34, he felt compassion for them. Uh, literally, the text says he was deeply moved within. 
uh, the, the word refers to the kidneys. He felt their desperation in his gut here. He had compassion on them. The best definition I ever heard of compassion is your pain in my heart. And that's what Jesus was feeling. He was feeling the pain of all of those 20,000 people because, verse 34, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Beloved, can I tell you that he feels the same thing for your pain? He knows what's going on. He knows the anxieties. He knows the worries. He knows the pressure. He knows the loneliness. He knows all the success and he knows all the failures. And it touches him deeply. And the point that I would like to make to you is simply this. He not only knows and feels it, but it's in his heart to help. That's the point of all of this. He has the desire to help you and he has the power to help you. He doesn't just have to, he wants you. That's the point. He has the heart to help. So, I would just ask you, you ever think nobody cares about what you're going through? Because there are a lot of times in life where you just kind of feel all alone and you think, ah, what's the use? And maybe not even God cares. Well, the whole point of this here is he feels your pain deep within his heart. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews described him, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. He's a high priest who understands our weaknesses. Uh, the Greek verb, sympatheo, he sympathizes. He feels with. Whatever you're going through. And so he, he knows. So what do you got going on in your heart? That's the real question. Because he wants our hearts to be open to him doing the impossible. And sometimes there are addictions that just overwhelm us and we think, that's never going to change. Or we look out at our world. Does it seem to you that the world has gone a little crazy? And how in the world is good going to come about? And I would venture to guess, just as I look out at you, my guess is that some of you here have raised your kids in the Christian faith, but your kids have not followed through. Maybe your grandkids. And you just wonder, where, where did it go wrong? I was just with a friend uh, just a few weeks back. A year ago, um, both his kids, two sons, adult kids with their, their children, actively involved in church. He said one year later, they're both divorced. They both have rejected the Lord. So what, what, where, what? The confusion was just all over him. He said, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And we think nothing's ever going to change. So, so whatever it is that you bring to the service this morning, just understand you're not alone in it. Uh, open your heart. Don't be afraid to hope. Open your heart to the Lord because he gets it. He knows what's going on there. And uh, he wants your heart to be open to it. Now, do the quick check. Are you open? Something new? Something different? Not everybody is. Uh, and the disciples were in that court. And that's why, uh, secondly, they, they needed to have the Lord instill a new vision in them about what God can do. Uh, verse 35. When it was already late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate, it's remote, and it's already quite late. 
send them away so that they may go into the sounding, resounding, uh, surrounding countryside and villages and buy for themselves something to eat. So the guys are tired. They're bone tired. So let's call it a day. Send everybody home. Send everybody out to get some food. We understand that. But the Lord, he just does things differently. Verse 37, he answered them, you give them something to eat. The you is emphasized in the original. You 12, you take care of this problem. Feeding 20,000 people. Thus, verse 37, they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii? Uh, eight months of a man's wages. So uh, say somebody, just round figure, somebody makes 10 grand a month. You want us to spend $80,000 on bread and give them something to eat? You couldn't be saying that. That's a small fortune. You, you, you couldn't be talking about that. Has the Lord ever asked you to do something crazy? Because he does sometimes. I want you to forgive him. He doesn't deserve forgiving. And I'm not saying you have to be his best friend ever again, or that you even trust him. I'm just telling you, you have to forgive him. And sometimes we need a new vision for what God can do in our hearts and in our lives here. Because he's the God who can do the impossible. We don't know how we can do it, but, but he does. And that then becomes the principle that he's teaching. You see, I think all of us, we have a tendency to focus on a problem of the things that we can't do. And we read things in the scriptures. And we, I, there's no way I could do that. There's no way I could forgive. There's no way I could uh, go on that trip and reach out. No way I could speak to my neighbors. There's no... Well, he doesn't focus on problems. He focuses on the potential of problems of what he can do. And he wants to show to the disciples his awesome power. But their first thought is, no way. There's no way. They don't have a vision for it. So Jesus, verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Now, why send them on the process? Because of the principle. See, they're just thinking with human wisdom, and they're not taking into account divine wisdom. And it's not wrong to think with human wisdom. You just can't rest on that wisdom, because God supersedes it. See? They're thinking only of the kingdom of the world principles. He's thinking about kingdom of God principles. They're thinking of their power and what they don't have. He knows what he has. As the divine son of God. See? So he says, go, go and count. They got five and two. But what good is that? God can't do anything with five and two, can he? And that's where we get stuck. There's no way. God's got something new and fresh for you. You've been married for 38 years and kind of fallen into some patterns. Is there something new? A new vision for your marriage that God would have for 2024? Some of you might be Widows or widowers, all the single folk. Is there a new vision for your singleness? Is there a new vision from New Song Church? Is your heart open to it? Because not everybody is here. And so God's going to take them through this process now. He says, I understand what's going on in your life. I want to give you a new vision for what I can do because I even have the power to thirdly multiply limited resources. 
verse 39. He commanded them all, sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took five loaves, two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. They're completely filled. He just said, keep eating as much as you want. And he just kept giving it to them. And uh, the, the astounding part, these were poor folk. A lot of them didn't have food to eat. And Jesus is saying, I got plenty. And so he just multiplies and he multiplies and he multiplies. But the real point of all of this is for the 12 disciples. That's the main point of this. Verse 43, they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. We, we know this story of the multiplication. What is it that the Lord is saying to us? Because the, the lesson is really pretty straightforward. And it's simply this, is that little is much when it's placed in the Lord's hands. That's a lesson. Little is much. You may not have much, but if Going to, if it's going to be multiplied, you have to put that little into his control. See? The little that you have. Lord, I'm, I'm going to give this to you. And I have this conversation uh, oftentimes with people, especially with uh, younger folks who, I was just up at Calvary Chapel Bible College. I teach up there, and, and it was... Uh, young married couple, and they said, Dennis, what, what do we do if we're poor? And I said, give something. Give something. Throw a dollar in the basket. The amount isn't the issue. It's your heart. Do you want to give it? If you want to give it, give something. The amount is between you and the Lord. It's his money. He's entrusted it to you. So, throw something in the basket. Said, well, if I do that, will God make me a millionaire this week? I said, I don't know, maybe. All I know is it's not going to be multiplied unless you put it into his hands. So, some of you have more resources than others. Some of you don't have much. You're going to have to put it into his control, the little that you have. And, and it, uh, uh, this lesson is it's seen throughout the scriptures. In my preparation, I thought of Moses. Remember Moses in the Old Testament? He, gets, uh, he runs out of Egypt, ends up in Midian. God appears to him in a burning bush and says, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to... Let my people go. Moses, uh-uh. That's a bad idea, God. There's no way. First thing that God says to him, here's uh, Exodus chapter 14. Look at this, uh, Exodus chapter 4. Look at, look at this illustration. The Lord looks at, at uh, Moses and says, what's that in your hand? Just a stick. Just a staff, raw pole. God says, throw it on the ground. Take the little that you have and do with it what I tell you. And it became a servant. That's when God acted. See? The little that was in his hand, he had to put under God's control before it was multiplied. So, have you put it? See, this, these are the things that are deep within our hearts. Because we get afraid, you know. There's this whole idea of scarcity that kind of paralyzes us sometimes. Because if I do this, I might not have enough.
Tell me I'm not the only one. I'm kind of bleeding up here in front of you. Any of you, have, any of you go through this? That's what I go through. And that's why I have to go through sometimes a process. I was just doing this at my desk the other day. As I look out at 2024, I have to reach out my hands and give them my fear, my apprehension, my anxieties and my worries, uh, all of the pressure. And I just have to let them go. I've got, I got to put them into his hand. My kids and my grandkids and my future and my ministry. And I don't know. You think that would help you? your heart open to it? He gets it. He knows what's going on. He's got a vision for it, do you? He can multiply resources. We should open our hearts to God doing the impossible because, fourth, He has the power to help me resist temptation. Right after the feeding of the 5,000, something really crazy happens. Mark doesn't record it, but the Apostle John did. And he puts it in John chapter 6. Look what, look what happens after the feeding of the 5,000. When the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, the multiplying of the five and, and the two to feed everybody, when they saw that sign, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Uh, Moses had predicted, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, that the Messiah would rise up and be a prophet like Moses was. Okay. And everybody was expecting the Messiah to be like Moses, like the prophet. Moses had multiplied, if you will, bread in the wilderness. Remember the manna that came from the sky? Well, Jesus just had done the same kind of thing. Multiplied bread for the people. He said, this, this is the prophet. But no, notice what they do. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by, what's the word? By force, to make him, what? King. You know what they're thinking? They're thinking messianic revolution. How many men were fed with the five loaves and two fish? You remember the number? 5,000 men. That makes a pretty good army. Day one, 5,000 volunteers. So they're all thinking, this is the guy. All we need is some weapons, and now we're going to take on Rome, and we're going to throw the oppressive yoke off our necks, and we are finally going to be free. So let's take him and make him the king. And Jesus wants none of it. Not because one day he won't do that rule over an earthly kingdom. It's just that the people weren't ready for it because they were still in their sin. And he had to die on the cross to bring them forgiveness, to transform them internally before the external could be properly exercised. And so he sends everybody away. And he goes up on the mountain by himself. I don't want anything of having to do with this messianic revolution. Now, if we go back to our text in Mark chapter 6. Look at it. He says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. Jesus says to the twelve, 
get in the boat now. He made them. Interesting. Same verb translated force in John chapter 6. He forced them to get into the boat, the 12 guys. Why? The implication is they wanted the messianic revolution just like all the people did. See, That was their whole hope that Jesus would start his earthly kingdom immediately. That was everything that they expected. And so now this great revolution and the fervor is going on and they're, let's go! And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. Get in the boat now and get out of here because you are not ready. You are not ready prepared. You are not strong enough. You can't handle this. And that's the story of my life, but I don't know about you. Because I think I can handle some things, but the Lord knows I can't. You think you'll face some temptations this week that you can't handle? There's just some things that are too much for us. And I think Paul was speaking of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. See this verse? A uh, familiar verse, uh, no temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. I get tempted, you get tempted, we all get tempted. Every, it happens to everybody. Uh, God is faithful, not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. He's not saying that you will avoid temptation. You're going to face temptation. But there is an escape so that you will be able to endure it. See? Lord, I'm not strong enough to face this. Whatever whatever it is, I can't do this. And that's why after you, palms down, We always go palms up. What is the international sign of surrender? I need your help. I will fail miserably. And you put put whatever that temptation is, because Lord, you're going to have to help me. You're going to have to force me into that boat. Because I get crazy in my head and I think that I can handle certain things, but I know that I can't. And I'm just ready to say, that was the whole point of that I mean it video. I can't do this. I look forward to a different 24. You know, all my great plans and all of that. I And that's his promise, is that he'll come through. Promise for you, and you, 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 and me. For all of us. We just have to open our hearts to it. Because he gets it. He gives a new vision. He can take what little we have and multiply it out, even in the face of temptation. So we open up our hearts, finally to him to supply fifth, abundant courage to trust him. Abundant courage to trust him. Verse 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land, and seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. 
at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Uh, if we understand the time stamp uh, correctly, they've been on the Sea of Galilee rowing for nine hours. They're straining, verse 48. Uh, it's literally the word uh, being tortured. They're agonizing out in the middle of this lake and going nowhere. Jesus appears walking on the sea. Only God can do that. Verse 48. This was a verse I've never really fully understood till recently. And he intended to pass by them. When I first read that, I thought, he's just going to go, hey, fellas, hang in there. He was going to Until I realized it doesn't say he was going to pass them by, but he was going to pass by them. And I realized that that verb, to pass by, is used in a very specific sense in the Old Testament of when God revealed himself to people by passing by them. It's what he did with Moses. He passed by Moses so that Moses could see who he was. He did it with Elijah. He passed by so that Elijah could see who he was. The glory that was to be revealed, his magnificence, his power and everything. And that's what he is doing here. And by passing by them, I think he hoped that they would call him into their problem. That's why I was walking to him. That's why he was passing by them. Call, call me in. Call me into the trouble, the struggles. Notice how they respond, verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. They're thrown into a complete panic. Why? Because they didn't expect Jesus to show up in their problem. We got to do this ourselves. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. See, and a lot of believers approach life that way. And if you want 2024 to be different, you're going to have to open up your heart to the torture that you're going through and get a new vision of his power to help you be the person that you want to be in. Verse 50, immediately he spoke to them and said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Who's that for this morning? Whatever your circumstance, Jesus is saying to you, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. What's his message? I'm right here for you. You, you are discouraged. You, you, the courage has gone out of you. I want to encourage you. I want to put my courage into you. Because you don't have it. You, you're, you're not going to do this. But I'm right here. And that's what he did, verse 50, when he got in the boat, when he stopped, utterly astonished. Uh, Mark doesn't record Peter walking on the water because it's not about Peter. They're completely amazed, just blew their minds, verse 52. Then notice this. They had not gained any insight from the incident 
of the loaves. Say, how in the world could that be? They just saw him multiply five loaves and two fish to, fi to feed 20,000 people, and it had no impact on them. They still didn't put together who he was and what he can do. Yep, they still didn't get it. Why not? Verse 52, but their heart was hardened, was petrified, was calloused, was numb, dull and sensitive, <coughs> incapable of grasping the truth of Jesus' power to do the impossible. And because of that, the miracle in the morning had no impact on their impossible situation in the evening. And before we're too hard on them, how's your heart? Are you really open to the Lord doing something impossible? Or does it just seem like nothing's ever going to change? Nothing could be really different. He saved you in the past. He did that miracle. There's other times that he stepped in, I'm sure. But how's that heart of yours? Can it be trusted? That's what it really comes down to, doesn't it? For 2024, can it be trusted? Hope your heart's open to it. Let me finish our time, just tell you one quick story. A member in our church assembly, a uh, successful businessman, uh, owned an engineering company, was doing well. He and his wife and their family bought a large piece of parcel, a uh, parcel of ground out in uh, Ramona. Farm, kind of a barney kind of place. And uh, then 2008 hit and the Great Recession, and he lost his business. And uh, it really knocked him for a loop. His mortgage was big. He had no idea what he was going to do for food. And they were living on their savings, and they were running out of savings. And so uh, one day he thought, okay, well, what am I going to do? And uh, down in one of the barns that they had bought was a freestanding safe. You know those safes that have the big combination locks on them, those big freestanding. He always wondered what was inside that safe. True story. And so uh, got an acetylene torch, burned off those hinges, and that door fell open. Guess what he found inside? An envelope. And in that envelope were three $100 bills. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord, will you? When, when you've got nothing, 300 bucks is a lot. You know, he was hoping for Apple stock or Berkshire Hathaway stock or some ridiculous thing like that. Three $100 bills. And he thought, well, there's food for a few days for my family. So he put the money in the envelope, put it in his pocket. I'm going to go tell my wife I've got $300. And he's walking up to his house, and he looks up ahead, and in the ground, there's this thing sticking out of the ground. It was kind of a Barney place, like I had mentioned. And when it rained, stuff would kind of pop up. And so he did what most guys would do. He went up and kind of kicked it with his foot, you know, try and dig the thing out. He reached down and he pulled out a bracelet, plastic bracelet. <laughs> On the bracelet were written two words. It said, 
trust me. And he realized that the God of the universe had just spoken to him. He may not give me everything that I want, but he's going to take care of me. And all I have to do is trust him. So, I told that story to our assembly, and uh, happened to be a man from our church went out and got bracelets, these red thingies. On it are the words, trust me. And I added the verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to it, that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Is your heart open to trust in him? Really? Because that's what he wants. You want your heart open and for you to put your trust fully in him. Anybody this morning haven't, who hasn't yet trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you know you've messed up. You've sinned. Jesus, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I believe you died for my sins, that you paid my penalty. I believe that that you're buried, that you rose again. I believe that you're alive. I want you as my Savior. Not my family, say, my Savior. Come into my heart, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I want to follow you. Anybody this morning? Jesus, save me. I'd venture to guess most of us are Christ followers or else we wouldn't be here this morning. If you are, will you renew that commitment of, to trust the Lord in 2024? It even starts on December 31 of 2023, doesn't it? So, let's bow our heads together and everybody take a real deep breath, will you? Now, just use this quietness. What is it that the Lord has said to you and you want to say back to him? Just between you and him. And if you make some new kind of commitment to trust the Lord, will you tell somebody? And I brought with me some of these red bracelets. If it would help you, uh, Pastor Hal has them. But in order to get one, just one, don't, don't take, you know, five for your family and do other, just take one. But to do that, you've got to tell them a little of your story. And you can see them afterwards. But All right, let's conclude our, our time with this prayer for 2024. God of all creation, as we look ahead to another year, we look above to you. Your grace is enough. Your mercy is new every morning. And your power is made perfect in our weakness. 
This year we have faced many trials. We have fought many battles. We have learned many lessons, and we have prayed many prayers. But this is our hope in life and in death. You are the God who sees. You are the God who knows. You are the God who cares. And you are the God who loves. And so we pray for courage to face our giants. We pray for grace to cover our guilt. We pray for strength to overcome our challenges. We pray for joy in all circumstances. And we pray for vision to see what you see. We don't know what we will face this year, but we do know this, it will never be faced alone. Amen. So, day 365, uh, you can have that if you want. Dave's gonna sit on the stool. Uh, fantastic job, Dennis. Uh, I sat through it twice, so I learned twice as much as the rest of you did. Be open to Jesus doing the impossible in your life. That starts tomorrow, right? No. Yeah, right now, that's right. Uh, you know, Pharaoh at one point, um, Moses said, hey, if you want, I'll release you from this plague. He said, I want. He said, so when do you want that to happen? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Well, that's the stupidest thing you've ever heard, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're frogs in your kitchen. You want them to be gone today. <laughs> right now, it starts today. And, and what, what's the motto? Trust, trust me. Trust me. We're going to trust him, and maybe he'll work a miracle. We know he'll do the best for us possible, right? So uh, we're going to celebrate that in just a second. If you need prayer, prayer partners, would you come up here? We're going to have prayer. Uh, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. This is your time when you get to do whatever you want with your fives and twos and see what God might do with them. And uh, we're going to sing our last song of the year. So let's make it a good effort, shall we? Uh, Father, as we pray, thank you that you always hear, that you're always with us. You never leave us or forsake us, that we can trust you. We're going to entrust our prayers to you right now. We're going to entrust some of our treasures to you right now. And we're going to entrust our praise to you right now. You are a great God. And your name is Jesus. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Come get prayer. Oh 
those are great words to end your worship for the year on, aren't they? Great are you, Lord. And I want to say some good words over you, but first I want to uh, tell you about this guy here. You all know Lucas? <laughs> this is Lucas Hembold, good friend of mine. Uh, so I found Lucas at a conference two years ago, and the Lord sort of nudged me that maybe we could help him and he could help us. So Lucas has been hanging out here for two years. He leads once a month on Sundays and, and uh, does some other stuff behind the scenes the rest of the weeks. And, uh, but, but he's, uh, just as I found him, he was graduating from college with a degree in technical sound stuff, engineering. audio engineering. And, uh, <laughs> and he's from Orange County and, and, um, uh, some folks up there have offered him a tremendous opportunity to, to lead two days a week and assist five days a week with the foremost recording studio in all of Orange County. Uh, so, yeah. So he's agreed to come back once a month to, to lead us in worship so Brian can have a break. Um, and, but so like today is his last official full-time day and then we'll see him... Uh, the last Sunday of January, but I wanted you all to be able to say thank you. So why don't you just do that right now? We appreciate you very much. Thank you. I have bracelets afterwards, but here's the words I want to conclude our year with. So bow your heads. In fact, do this. Let's raise our hands in universal surrender. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you the rest of the day and all year long next year. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. See you next year.